Now let's move on to a fireside chat. The topic of this session is how much the future of the automotive and transportation industry depends on OEMs. The speakers will take you through the criticality of original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, in the product development life cycle, and how their agility can drive profits and bring down costs for the entire automotive world. To initiate a discussion around this subject, we have here with us Vineet Singh, president of Gauss Moto Inc., and Jonathan Call, who is the supply chain president at Next Reality. Please welcome them with a warm round of applause. Hello, everybody. I guess you're all um, attentive here after that great opening there from our previous speaker. Great discussion. Um, making money. Anyway, Vineet and I are here. We're going to talk about not only, well, how critical OEMs are uh, to the marketplace um, moving forward, especially with the mobility trends and everything that we're living in, but also I'm going to delve in a little bit into what needs to change moving forward for them to you know, th thrive and be able to deal with that kind of change um, with their business models and whatnot. So we're going to kind of come at it from two different angles. Um, both are going to be discussing uh, the obvious need and use for technology and specifically next generation software technology to be able for OEMs to be able to make it and be able to develop products and deliver and make products with this hyper change coming in at the market. Avneet has an um, amazing next generation software platform to help integrate all the software technologies within these um, the autonomous, the connected, the electric vehicles, etc. And I'm going to be discussing the changes in the, some disruptive technology that we as Next Reality have developed to help OEMs respond, make those products faster using some technologies related to Industry 4.0, but also supply chain technologies that have not been adopted yet to the market but which will allow them to rapidly accelerate, make, and deliver functions to the end, end customer. So with that, I'm going to let Vineet start off. Sure. Uh, my name is Vineet Singh. I'm the president and co-founder of Cosmodo. Uh, we are an early stage startup helping uh, big companies and startups who want to uh, transition into next generation of mobility services. Uh, our specialty is networking, connectivity, uh, it's not focused on any particular uh, segment. We are making a cross-platform anyone can use, whether they are making two-wheelers, boats, cars, or trucks. Uh, basically, our approach is to build a computer that can adopt it for any kind of vehicle. Uh, that's uh, previously I worked with a couple of OEMs and startups, and very well understand like what OEMs need and what are the challenges they are facing every day. Um, so yeah, that's about the background. Now the, the, the topic we're going to discuss today, how much the future of automotive and transportation depend uh, on OEMs? Well, I would say everything depends on OEMs. If you are into Bay Area or anywhere in the technology part of the world, you will find tons of companies are coming up with new technology, whether it's machine learning, AI, camera, computer vision, you name it, LiDAR. They are like 10, 15 OEMs in US, but they are 100 of LiDAR companies. They all are targeting uh, autonomous vehicles. And billions of dollars being invested in this, uh, developing this technology. If OEM is not taking these technologies to the customers, there's no use, right? So after all, um, OEM has to make a call which technology they want to go forward, which they don't want. I mean, most of people have seen Tesla do not want to have LiDARs in their cars. The rest, of the rest of the industry want to rely on the LiDARs, but Tesla don't. So it's, it's totally uh, depending like what OEM thinks going forward the future is. So again, um, very well depend on OEMs, how they think, because they are the one who are directly connecting to, to the end customers, and they are the face of the customer. You have suppliers, you have technology companies, you have, you know, a channel partner who talk, talk to your OEMs and OEM take it forward to the customers. At the end, they are delivering what customer want. But it's, it's not easy. Like, things are changing a lot with this innovation and the technology. 
when I was working with one of the OEM, the largest OEM in the US, um, we realized mostly we are targeting and thinking more on from hardware point of view. But whereas now everything is changing. Everything is all about software right now. Traditionally, when we talk about the connectivity in the car, it used to be OBD dongle that read your canvas and transmitting all the information to the cloud and where you can see things. But now, connectivity is totally different. You have 40, 45 different computers in the car and they are all talking so, and they are running millions of lines of code. The connectivity is not just a telematics OBD, it's much more than that. Backhand, you need to do over the air update, you need to do uh, a lot of uh, upgrades, uh, whether you want to do maintenance, you want to issue new features, it's a lot of going on there. Now, OEM alone cannot do everything. They need a lot of support from technology partner, startup, infrastructure, everybody. And that's where the things are getting very, very complex. Right now, everyone in the race to say, we are the number one technology. And unfortunately, what I see, everyone is developing their systems in silo mode. No one is developing a cross platform that can be used by everybody. Think about like when I started my career back in 2004 in four industry. There was Nokia, there was LG, there was Motorola. Uh, you know, maybe now new generation may not know these names. And they all are fighting on features. Oh, I have a, this game, I have this camera, I have this FM things. But whereas another company, Apple, they're not talking about any feature. They don't have FM, they don't have SD card, they don't have, uh, um, you know, many features they are fighting. They are building infrastructure, they are building how to monetize their hardware, software, everything. And I do see a same problem here in, autonomous, uh, in automotive industry. Everyone is talking about, look, we are unique. But and for, they're all doing the same thing, but they're presenting <coughs> they're unique. They all are developing their infotainment system, um, their same app, and connectivity for OEM, mostly I see, they think, infotainment is a connectivity. That's not. Connectivity, you look, every, your, every component in the car, every, so, every piece of software running in the car need to be updated over the air. You don't need to have physical uh, interaction with the car. So that's where the connectivity is. Now, the biggest challenge to achieve that goal where Tesla is, is right now is OEMs do not have in-house expertise they still rely on third party. Someone, someone providing the operating system, middle layer um, application, infotainment system, ADAS system, and they are getting the maze of complexity. You, all OEM are talking to like 15, 20 different uh, partners to integrate system. And when it comes to integration, it becomes such a mess. And the, the supplier, they say, okay, that's fine, but someone has to uh, integrate, and that's an OEM, and that's making things very, very critical. And when they take these car into production, they have to deal with all the certification, homologation, all kind of things. That's making super, super complex. Another thing, what I have seen, this is not mature enough. We, uh, all the OEMs are trying different, different new things. Um, they, are, they are taking a different approach, for computer vision, ADAS system, and, uh, different approaches. And when they are building such system, they are just buying some marketing slides. Oh, the company X come with, okay, we have computer vision, we have this camera, we have connectivity, we have 5G, and they are using that kind of information to build their system. And when they integrate that thing, it takes like two, three years, and when it's come out, it's not performing as they expected. And still, they have to go back and forth, working with the, your suppliers, your technology partner. That becomes much more complex. And whenever they need to change something, it takes another uh, round of discussion, making money, so, so, so complex. Um, so this, this is another problem with this one is the supply chain. So when OEMs need to build some car or any, or any 
sort of vehicle, they're good at on calculating the bomb cost. You know, this sensor gonna cost this much, this camera gonna cost this much, fine, $35 car, we build it, we're gonna sell it for 45,000. But when it comes to, you know, buying a software, they have no idea. They just go and, you know, send some request of information, how much it's gonna cost, and they say $2 million or $35 million. They don't know which one to choose, and what they do, they say, okay, this is for $2 million, this is $35 million, let's take a middle one, 15. And after that, when they integrate that, they realize after three years of time, it's not performing as they expect. So that is a, one of the challenge I do see uh, in OEM in, uh, right now. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Diaz. I work with Juice Bar. We do electric vehicle chargers. Sure. Um, and small world, I, I've met you before through one of my mentors, Stephen Torres. It was maybe four years ago. Uh, he's a professor at UC Berkeley. War uh, we can revisit that. Um, anyway, right now, when it comes to electric vehicle chargers, the targets are really speed tracking, ease of use, and safety. And I'm curious. From your perspective, what, what do you think the future of EV chargers needs to look like to support the future of where vehicles are going? Um, I mean, it, it, which term you want to know? Like, uh, future of electric charger, in what terms I want to look? So right now you're talking about what the software needs to look like in OEMs, and I'm curious, what do you think user interface needs to look like? or? What is the future of uh, the customer experience look like when it comes to electric vehicle chargers for to support this future that we're transitioning into? Well, definitely we need more charging station. Um, I'm, again, I'm not really expert on uh, charging sites, so that's not my core expertise. But what I am seeing right now, I'll tell you another um, good use case of electric charger. Right now, everyone you talk about in automotive industry, they're talking about these new EVs, these new autonomous vehicles will generate terabytes of data. And there will be 5G that will, you know, upload all the data to the cloud. But think about like how much it will be costly. One, if you have to send it one GB of data to the clouds, it's gonna take maybe $5 or something, or maybe $4. If you have to, if you have to upload one terabyte of data, it will be much more. So, how I uh, see it in EV infrastructure and uh, autonomous vehicle infrastructure, the, the EV uh, charging station should tie up with connectivity. So whenever your car is charging some point of time, um, you have like 20, 10 minutes to like 40 minutes. At that time, all the data should go through Wi-Fi for analysis or edge computing or whatever it is, and that should be uploaded, and by that time, you have plenty of time to get all the data to be uploaded to the cloud for analytics. That's where you, uh, a lot of partnership can be done and the cost of EVs, uh, charging station can be reduced. Uh, no doubt EVs, charging station, as I said, like I'm not really expert on that topic, so I'll pass that question if you have some, something to say. Yep, you wrapped up with questions. Or... Yeah, any other questions? We're gonna leave some time at the end, I guess, too, for questions, right? So as far as with the connectivity and everything like that and the right to repair bills that obviously we all know that's in front of New York and Massachusetts right now, how do you foresee with the OEs and the alliance they have going against aftermarket manufacturers and that on the right to repair, how do you foresee that in what you're doing also with having connectivity, and you said the OEs don't do bring a lot of this stuff in house, they rely on third party companies to innovate and bring this new technology. How do you foresee that delta kind of hitting at the middle? Well, it will be more on predictive maintenance. So right now, whenever you have a problem in your car, you just take to a dealer, right? And they just do a diagnostic and just tell you what exactly need to be fixed going forward. Um, you know, every sensor will be sending the data that will be uploaded to your cloud, whether through Wi-Fi or through cellular, and that time they will analyze predict. And they can do 
pre-trip maintenance, okay, this car need a maintenance or this particular ECU, there are two terms like whether you can do a remote diagnostic, whether through cloud, if there's something patch need to be updated through, uh, you know, over the air update, you can do that, new software can fix that, that can be done. Second approach, you may need to go to a dealer because that's physical or mechanical change need to happen. That time uh, you need, um, you know, physically visit to the shop. Another is like a lot of companies are talking about a mobile kind of network. So there will be a mobility network of vans. They are equipped with all these sensors, uh, tools and everything. They can come to your uh, vehicle. They all automatically get to know that this particular area has five or six vehicles they need some maintenance, diagnostic, uh, they can come with their van, same like Tesla did. When Tesla Model S was in production and they certainly saw a lot of problems and they, they roll out their mobility vans instead of you visiting their service center because service center do not have that so many uh, space to accommodate like 40 cars. So they send while you are in office, the Tesla car or any car uh, van, repair van will come and repair everything. So that will, transition, it, it will be mostly uh, like ad hoc base and like freelancing base. I would say now the car companies, the car OEMs know what's going in your car. If they have prehistory, like this particular software, this particular car has some bug, they can release num software. Now with the connectivity, they know better. But initially when there's no connectivity, it's a black box, you have to visit. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. Thanks, sure. Um, so my name is Jonathan Call, and I'm the president of Next Reality's uh, Veco Supply Chain Division. And I want to talk about a few topics here related to the state of the OEMs themselves and the fact that um, coming from a background of manufacturing, automation, and supply chain um, and out of uh, Detroit area, um, the, the technology that they're using will not today and cannot handle the pace of change that's coming with the mobility trends and everything that's hitting them right now. So they are right for game-changing technology right now. Um, as he was saying, just the connectivity within the vehicle that's gonna be required um, and having some kind of a common backbone to do that quickly and efficiently is critical versus hiring you know, big tech firms that do one-off developments. Same thing for the actual ability to make the, make the cars and deliver the cars through a hyper supply chain to deal with this. So it's ACEs now, right? So it's autonomous connectivity, shared, electric. But who knows what's coming, who's, what's coming first, next, last. So the OEMs have to become very agile, okay, and be able to make, have agile manufacturing. But also, once they make stuff, they have to get it to market fast, okay? So that's our background. We've developed some very next generation technology um, has been proven out across uh, running, uh, starting with Hewlett Packard as a, a supplier into the automotive industry, running their entire worldwide supply chain. Um, as you know, that industry is super fast product life cycles. It's where most of this type of technology has emerged from. Um, and so we've taken that uh, technology and adapted it specifically for the automotive industry. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and in, in, in a little bit about the technology they need to use um, moving forward. Because like I'm telling you, I, I walk in the plants every day, talk to their people, the disruptions. Um, they just are not going to be able to make and deliver stuff in the speed that the, the, net, the you know, Gen Zs, Ys, and Millennials are going to expect. So anyway, so yeah, so we're, they're going to need new next, they're ne going to need next generation business models, relationships with their um, partners and suppliers in a way to collaborate with them quickly, and also technologies. And there's no way to, we're not gonna compete without software technologies as a competitive advantage, okay? So I just wanna read a couple of trends right now um, as far as why, why is this required? Um, I mean, trends, uh, statistics, and some problems that, <laughs> so according to the Wall Street Journal, back on March 24th, they wrote um, that they expected the industry in 2021 to, to be able to restock um, but the supply chain problems are extending the crunch. Disruptions have hit almost every major auto manufacturer on every continent. 
Uh, car makers have cut production 1.2 million vehicles in North America alone. And General Motors said that the lost production has hurt their uh, pre-tax profit by 2 billion and Ford pegs it at 2.5 billion, okay? This is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? Um, and back in December, Forbes um, put out an article where they estimated that bankruptcies are gonna just be prevalent throughout all sectors, basically because of the way everything's changed. Um, not just COVID alone, but even pre-COVID with all the technology changes and the requirements moving forward of technology. So basically they warn, be prepared for more innovative, best of breed brands and, and startups and manufacturing models. So that's kind of what we're both here to talk about from two different angles, from kind of the inside and then the outside. Um, so basically what does that mean for the industry and um, how, how, how are these, with the salvos of changes that are hitting, how are the OEMs going to be prepared for that? And um, I have a statement here that's kind of the, the kind of the, the overarching statement, which is that the OEMs, you know, why are they important to the market? They're basically, they're critical because they have to provide these new mobility solutions and the products that are flooding in, but they need the agility to make and deliver at an ever increasing pace. And I know I've kind of said that before, but so what are the key market forces that are driving those trends right now? And um, I, there's so many of them, I just have a couple bullets I wanna um, key off of. The first is managing this transition from the use of IC powered vehicles, right? To this more complex mix of ACEs um, uh, that, that, are, that have come. They also, the use of the, the cloud-based collaboration platforms um, is a trend that they're gonna have to, to develop and accommodate with the integration of the, the Internet of Things, the IoT devices, okay, um, into all the multiple touch points in the automotive supply chain. Um, it's a, another critical tr trend um, that we actually saw happening back in the MES and in, in the actual manufacturing plant itself with inter um, IoT and it, as the transportation industry picks up uh, Internet of Thing devices and tracking. The supply chain across the whole supply chain is now picking that up and helping deliver this kind of technology. Um, excuse me. Well, we have another problem, which is that there's an ever less, with, as we saw with COVID, there's an ever less resilient international global supply chain. Um, you know, with whatever the geopolitical forces and everything that are happening um, is highlighted by critical choke points, like what happened with Suez Canal, and the effect that that can have on just blocking the entire worldwide supply chain. So issues like that in companies, in automotive OEMs, today, without these new technologies, are not gonna be able to respond to these types of disruptions and unexpected demands and increased um, requests on the changing um, requirements of the, of, of the market. So they basically, one of the things they have to do is they have to consider a more consumer-centric approach to um, taking orders through this immersive online environment um, that Edwin spoke of uh, earlier um, and won one of the uh, awards here this morning for um, that they're developing, which is a mind-blowing way to um, do the purchase experience. But once the purchase experience is made, it needs to get handed off to an ability to make, fulfill, deliver that to the client so they can get the money Okay, so that whole life cycle, and um, we don't know of any other companies out there that are taking these two pieces as a full life cycle solution and bringing that to market. But so one of the critical things that's changing is that the industry has to move from what traditionally has been a make, I mean a design, make, and then pr uh, design, make, and sell. So they basically make to stock. So they got, you know, the engineers, they go and say, okay, we're gonna make and design all these kind of Chevy. We think this is what's gonna happen in two years. So they design and they make and they pre-build stuff and they send stuff into stock and warehouses. And then the, the dealerships try to push the slinky sphinx, right, at the moment. So that's gone, that is not gonna work, obviously. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna go into their dealers or their immersive dealers, they're going to pick and select all their unique little options, choices, um, their personalization trends, et cetera. 
that they need, and then that basic automobile, which could be completely unique, we're talking lot size of one, like the Nirvana, let's make a custom car to one person and a lot size of one and deliver it to them, maybe not as fast as Amazon, but in a not take eight to 10 months um, or more in the current Excel-based customer service agents trying to figure out where the disruptions are in the supply chain. You need an overarching back, backbone that's giving you visibility across that entire supply chain from the set of supplier, 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 back to the Intel chip, through the contract manufacturing and the OEMs and their suppliers and their people, through the, the 3PLs, the transportation, and then the customers and the customer's customer. So right now, there is not that end, end to end visibility until now. So, um, so that's what we're bringing to market. Um, so that trend is going from um, make or design, make and sell. It's flipping to sell, then design it, and then make it. So it's basically a make to order model versus a make to stock model in traditional manufacturing t terminology. Um, but taking into consideration the personalization trends. So that the, 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 the next generation, they expect this. They want to walk in, customize stuff, and have it be able to be delivered very soon. So that's not, that's going to continue. That's what we're going to see in the amount of industry. Those, they, there's, systems are not set up to do that right now. They do not have the software technology or the infrastructure or the, you know, the, even the internal, um, the people process and technology, the internal business processes in place to deal with this kind of change. Okay, so, excuse me, I had a printed out a later version. Okay, so, my, so what I was transitioning to now, um, Okay, so we just discussed um, the needs moving forward, or I mean, the, what's driving and what needs to happen. So now it's basically for the OEMs, um, we just, I just don't want to repeat myself, so I'm gonna skip this section. Okay, so let me jump into some specifics of examples of what I'm talking about with that. So, um, at the end of the day, we don't the, we don't want the OEMs ending up like you know. Do you remember Kodak? What happened with BlackBerry? What happened with Barnes and Noble? Blockbuster? They wouldn't change with the needs that changed. Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about here. That the OEMs are fundamentally critical to bring this this. The OEMs have to bring the products to market. I was also, without side story, involved in trying to acquire the Wilmington Delaware plant closed during the Obama administration, the only East Coast plant, port and rail access to Europe. I put the automation systems in through um, my General Electric um, contacts. Flexible manufacturing, lot size of 5,000 profitable. We're gonna use a third of the plant for electric vehification, incubation with the, with the government. Because the problem isn't technology. Okay, the problem is you have to become a car company. You have to deal with the regulations and the standards and all that to happen. So the OEMs are absolutely critical to get this technology to market. So here's some of the specifics that I'm gonna get into a little bit, and I could talk about this for four hours, so I, I've got a few bullets here on the critical things that, um, that what changes they need to make in their business practices and also to leverage to, okay, so one of the key things, they want to leverage your existing IT systems. No one's going to go out and rip out SAP, okay, in the plan. No one's going to go rip out Oracle or rip out their MES systems or their quality management systems. So you need this ability to tie in and pull all that data out of systems, not just from the OEM, but from their partners. So I want to take a second, I want to redefine an OEM for a minute in our world of delivery is even the critical suppliers. So the critical brake manufacturing or the steering um, assembly manufacturers. In, in, that, in their little world, they're an OEM, right? And so they're the first tier supply to the manufacturing plant of the OEM. But then they're suppliers to them with the power supply subassembly. And so this goes on and on and on, back and back and back. So, um, so in, in defining that, what they need to do is they, 
so these are some specifics. They need to more closely manage their production and inventory, right, to be based on the actual demand. And I spoke about that. Not, not make to, um, I mean, make to order, um, the make to order trend. That has to happen, which really they're transitioning to with some industry 4.0 capabilities. But where they end, end in, where we've actually been part of the standards body with industry 4.0, the last phase of industry 4.0, which has all the technologies with 3D printing and uh, additive manufacturing and new manufacturing models to help make stuff faster. But now it's the handoff to supply chain. And now how do we get this stuff to the customer, okay? So that's where the biggest challenge is right now. Um, so, so they want to base the actual demand. They also need a software mechanism. So all these partners need to collaborate better. When there's a problem and a disruption, um, to fix it, well, there can be automated business rules put in place through the software. But you need the system has to immediately spawn alerts to the key partners that are affected with this disruption and get them to figure out what they need to do to solve it before it becomes you know, a long delay. So th they need, this, this, this system needs to have a collaboration capability built into it. Um, similar to your discussion on why the collaboration is so critical amongst your yeah, piece. I mean, I'm I also just wrapping up here, but go ahead. Sure, so I spoke about a couple of the challenges, right? So everyone talk about the problem, like no one is you know, giving the right specific, what should we do? Um, if you see connectivity will open like $1.5 trillion market for everybody, you know, everyone's talking about, but how? No one is telling like how. Um, the Google, Facebook, you know, car insurance company, everyone want monetize the data and it will become a, a pool of $1 trillion uh, market. But what are the specific, like why OEMs are spending so much of money in this one? So I was talking to one of the German manufacturer a long time back, and they were asking me, I want to enable technology and connectivity in my car, and how much gonna take? I said, probably $400 or $500 the bomb cost, looking at the size of your company. I said, but how I'll recoup that money I invest? Um, I don't know. So, because if I put a connectivity, it's not cheap, it's expensive, right? And then I have to pay $5, $10, or $15, depend like how much data I need, how I can, you know, recoup that, that money off my investment, what's my ROI? Um, at that time, I don't have an answer. And I, after that, I researched. Now, all the car company are going towards Google Auto or CarPlay, but what they're going out of, out of it, they're investing whatever, like hundreds of dollars of putting that uh, instruments or that technology, but the data is going to them. How are they going to benefit? So the only way, uh, they can um, get a new revenue stream. They have to monetize everything, like iPhone did. You cannot just download any app on your phone without going iTunes. All the OEMs need to adopt that kind of model. Okay, you Facebook, you want to show some of ads on my car? Yes, you have to go to my cloud and I will monetize everything you are showing to my, uh, you know, uh, my customer. That's how you need to do. Insurance company, yes, definitely, but you cannot directly access to my customer. It has to go through everything on my channel. It has to monetize. OEMs also need to understand what the market shift is. Where is it going? Who are the next largest customers now? You know who? Lyft and Uber, they are the largest. They make 15, 11 billion dollar every year. Uh, you know, and what are their needs? I spoke to these company and I was surprised they are also struggling. They said, we lose claims of almost like $400 million every year because the car get into crash, it was on a service, on ride, and they come back and then say, okay, you know what? We were on our Uber or Lyft drive and the crash happened. We don't know what happened. It's a black box to us. But if a GM Ford say, okay, fine, I have all the data of I have IMU, Cairo, whatever it is. I will tell you exactly, I will put that file in my system, I'll tell how, speed, how much speed you're going forward, what happened, which this collision happened, fine. But you have to pay me something. Right now, what is happening, you have phone. The Ola, Uber, or Lyft, whatever, they are tracking the data sensor from the phone. 
Could be a phone fell down. You don't know, you can consider it a crash, but what if like car? So you need actual data. Same thing security. I don't know how many of you know, like 2019 Uber released, there are like six, five or 4,000 sexual harassment cases they publish. And no one knows why this happened. No one has data what happened to Kevin. These company can innovatively come up with some kind of solution when you, so this is okay, let me get, take a step back, what happened? There are so many companies, you take Uber, you can take Lyft, or you can say Didi, they're all are offering cheap ride from place one, place two. They do not take ownership what happened between the drive. They provide you cheap uh, pricing, okay? You will, you will be taking from this place to that place. But what happened if the driver's in trouble or passenger trouble, who will take the security? There's no mechanism. A Lot of car uh, drivers are putting a dash cam but that's in the direct control. They can temper it, they can do it. But again, if all these car companies start putting a camera system, now you will say, okay, it's a privacy. It's not, we are not going to stream anything to Uber or Lyft. We will use NLP, we will, dis we will detect what you're talking, this is a screaming thing, or whatever it is. We will, we will use computer vision to see the actions. We will monitor each and every activity our camera systems and our audio systems, what's happening? And we can detect if something's wrong, yeah, we have de uh, detected something, someone is screaming uh, or some unusual activity. We will send an alert to the passenger, are you okay? Like, same like ADT does. I need to finish, by the way, go ahead. Okay, so, so if they say, yeah, I'm okay, fine. If no one responds, you can immediately find out what's going wrong and it will be proactive action. Uber, Lyft cannot do that. The OEMs can do that. They can put the camera, they can put microphone. This is just giving some examples. And that's how they can make a new revenue stream because now everything is shared mobility, ride hailing services. That's how everything transitions. Same thing like for if you see herds, Avis, every, you, you get off from the plane, you have to wait for one hour with your child, with your luggage, wait someone has to write a contract. Oh, now you have the key, you have to haunt for the car, and then you take the car and you go away. Why can't you do some, everything auto, automated, uh, automated? You have an app, you know where the car is, you go to the car, everything is digitally contract. Like, if you exceed that speed, your contract is breached. If you are going out of uh, geofencing area, everything is breached. The car, when, when you take your car out from your hearts, there's a person who just check your VIN number and your face and then they write it down, okay, go. Why can't we use computer vision? Automatically a car, when we go out from the door, they will take 360 degree cam images. They will you know, record the VIN number. They can record the license plate number and say, okay, good to go. This is a time, these many miles you have traveled. If you are an accident, whether you tell or not, but my gyro or my accelerometer, they'll tell. Everything digital. You can save a lot of problem yep. of these things. Yep. Yeah, you can go ahead. No, it's a good straight man too, because as far as giving these predictive alerts and being able to be react to that and the value that's providing, um, which doesn't exist right now. Um, I got my last three or four points of specific um, capabilities that don't exist in today's current business models and technology for this, for <laughs> the overarching supply chain capabilities. And my next one, which is a great straight up uh, tee up man, is that they must adapt the ability to anticipate, okay, detect and anticipate early signals of disruption, okay, in the market. Um, Jesus, I thought I shut this off. Sorry. Um, early, early disruptions in the market ahead of time, relying on big data, IoT, um, just the ability to have that collaboration, um, the ability to see multiple tiers down the supply chain. So say, one quick example, a tier two uh, sub-assembly plant goes down in the middle of the night, who's delivering to the tier one, who has to get that product to adjust in line manufacturing at Ford next Wednesday at one o'clock, okay? So that first tier supplier is expecting that, needs that part in the morning. That plant went down earlier than the night before, okay? So an automated business rule can be set up in the software to say, hey, 
automatically sourced from an, an alternate approved supplier. And the next day, the truck shows up with the part, no, you know, no hitch, no glitch, and then the system tells the ERP system, okay, credit that guy, you know, debit that guy, this guy's sending the advanced shipment notifications and the good receipt notifications from this guy, not that guy. But the issue is the part still shows up, the guy deliver on time, and boom. So you anticipate by having this end-to-end -end visibility, without end-to-end -end visibility across the entire supply chain, which is a big buzzword right now. It's, I mean, one of the critical buzzwords of most of our competitors that are kind of, they're planning vendors and longer range planning vendors that are now trying to granularize down to this more fast reactive layer of supply chain that sits right on top of the world I came out of, which is industry for auto, MES, manufacturing, changing those models. But that next layer that can react, see, and then adapt and react and predict those disruptions ahead of time so that the inventory flows right through the supply chain with no disruptions. Now, sure, we'll still do long range SNOP, sales and operational planning. We'll still do all those great things. But those systems, probably 80% of the supply chain so software vendors are large planning companies. And they're trying, there's completely different architecture than the architecture that was developed. That's got a, we have over, um, excuse me, hold on. Over $40 million of development into the platform, and a lot, a lot of the patents are down in that ability to aggregate and harmonize, which is another very specific example. But like he said, so people will tell you, well, what do you got to do to change this? Th this kind of a system has to have this, it's basically a master data model, it's a federated master data model, but what it has to do is harmonize all the nomenclatures. Everyone calls a part a different SKU number, a different name, okay? They've siloed data systems at each, at each uh, company in that supply chain. So this system has to be able to take all that data, okay, without custom programming links and calling Accenture and SAP in to write a bunch of things and get that changed six months later. The system has to automatically be able to harmonize all that data so that then the partners can do cross-business process execution. Okay, that is completely revolutionary. No one's done it before. Okay, that's why HP, this is pre-split up, like late 2000s before <laughs> the company kind of fell apart, but pre-split up, this platform ran all five business units, segmented into nine value chains, um, orchestrating 450 suppliers and partners, so all their systems. There were 4,000 concurrent users, okay, all running on one multi-tenant hosted instance, okay. Um, so it won like all the crazy supply chain awards, and like it was kind of like the uh, out into the future Star Trek stuff. Um, but then, of course, HP kind of went by the wayside, and now we've taken that technology and all that, and we've, reinvent, we've kind of commercialized it, we're bringing that to market to the automotive industry. But anyway, so that ability to harmonize that data nomenclature, the end-to-end -end visibility, and the last couple things, it's gotta have a, this proactive alerting system, as I kind of gave you an example of that, or it could be weather patterns coming in, saying, hey, this boat's coming over from China with the parts, okay, that's it's, it's supposed to come into, the, in, into um, the port in San Diego, is gonna have to divert over to Oakland, and so we can take that AI and that big data information down into our level and factor that into our mathem mathematical planning engines, which run at a more tactical, fast basis, and then do the predictive alerts and connectivity to all the systems down at that next layer. Um, and then finally, so a, lot of, so a lot of people are talking end-to-end -end visibility in the marketplace. So visibility is great, and every, they can get visibility, okay? However, it's like the dental monitor commercial. Okay, oh, oh my God, oh my God. They're like, okay, you'll do something about it. Well, we're just a dental monitor, you know. The, you, the visibility is only good if you can then um, see that alert ahead of time, predict it, but then do something about it. So there has to be a real-time response capability, okay? So it's planning and execution. So it's, it's the execution, what we call the response capability, so that the problem can be resolved in real time reflecting the capabilities and constraints of all the partners. So our solvers and our math, math engines come up with, so when there's a, a disruption, it will show the critical partners. So here's the three optimal um, 
alternatives that can be taken. And they can simulate that and see the ripple effect of the supply chain. Choose one of those or decide on their own what they want to do. We could actually automate the whole supply chain and have it completely, you hear the big thing in the future, the autogenic, you know, autonomous, you know, self-running supply chain. Okay, well, without this layer, ain't going to happen, cannot happen, impossible to happen. Um, but we could put business rules in up and down the entire supply chain with our solvers running from the demand and, oh, hey, we have only this much in stock. we got to create the um, production orders on production, to, uh, create the bombs, explode the bombs, um, re reschedule to the MES systems on what's going to be run, and then create the material requirements plan to the suppliers, get that to the suppliers at a time, all automated, okay, 100%. So um, that, that is a critical requirement. So basically, in summary, you know, the OEMs must deliver a next generation. They have to have to deliver at this pace that change is coming. They've got to adopt new software and technologies, not only at the manufacturing level, but also at the supply chain level um, to be able to deliver and um, you know, effectively anticipate and address the challenges. And basically, in that case, then silicon's not going to be a problem anymore, okay? Because we can, we've got visibility, we've got alternate places to get it. We have, we can see where there's going to be a problem, okay, and deal with it. And so we don't want to end up like the next block, the next blockbusters or um, Xeroxes. Um, but the OEMs, they're so critical. They have to. Nothing's going to happen without OEMs bringing this stuff to market. But they've got to adopt to change. They have to adopt supply chain, I mean, software systems, like the needs to be able to coordinate all those different software tech. I mean, literally, what I'm talking about is almost, if you take it down at his microcosm of what's happening with all the changes in the different the mobility and all the systems within a car and a system, it's, 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 it's basically the same thing, just blown out at a, at a different level. Okay, so you need those basically backbone infrastructures to that all the decisions and um, systems can sit on, plug into, and be able to communicate and adapt. And, um, and that's the way that they're going to disrupt and change the marketplace. Sure. Yeah. Any questions on my end? Or Vineet, either way? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, did you speak up a little bit? The chip shortage that, that OEMs are experiencing our manufacturers today. Well. I mean, you see this as temporary. I, how long is it going to last? Most of these, a lot of these chip manufacturers are overseas. I'm just kind of curious. Right. Well, um, being in the supply chain business, you know, we obviously have to take them as a supplier and interact and deal with them. But I think a lot of that has to come back into the states. Um, you know, I think we, we've got we've to be um, more self-reliant, okay, number one. And um, I do think it's temporary, you know. They're, I mean, it's the spotlight's all over that right now, right? I mean, that's the glaring issue. So, um, yeah, the suppl there's suppliers that are going to have to be, that will, new startups, software, but then, that will happen at every level. New suppliers will have to come, and they'll emerge, and there'll be new ways, okay, and there's, there's new, entirely new crazy methods that are about to come out for the whole semiconductor um, manufacturing industry and area. Um, some of them are being piloted right now, but it's, it's, it's high speed next gen, so I do think it's gonna be short term. Sir? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chris Adams, Discount Tire. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on as the OEMs make a smarter car, a connected car, a more personalized vehicle, how does the aftermarket service world keep up with that? And you look at some of these tech OEMs that have built, you know, great personalized vehicles, um, you know, Tesla, for example, but I, I think in some cases they've fallen short from an aftermarket service uh, expectation. And, Absolutely. And, and do you think as you speak about the data, do you see, and part of the monetization of that, subscription models that do their best to drive them back into their network to create 
and, and uh, you know, a whole different revenue stream. And that's great. But if they're still falling short from a, you know, a, a quality and service expectation, that, that's a big failure. So it'd be good to understand your, you know, get it right on the front end, but how do you protect yourself from an OEM reputation on the back end? Right. It's a good question. And actually, both of us can address that from our own little dynamics. Briefly, from, my di from the supply chain perspective, um, I talked about, um, and it's actually an, um, a score, an APEX model, but um, those are standards bodies. But this whole, the past way to, you know, design, then make, then stock and deliver, and then the trend is now to, to sell, personalize, design that, and make and deliver it. But the fourth, there actually is a fourth um, acronym on it that I just said, which is the return, which is the ability to, to process that whole um, returns area. So um, that is built in from a supply chain standpoint, that whole process and that whole, those business processes are built into supply chain, our supply chain models in, in the applications. Um, and as far as monetizing them, um, let, let me do this. Yeah, let, let, me, let me let Vinita so, address that better. So I, I, you have a very valid question. So there is, you need to understand to Tesla versus like any other OEM. Tesla do not go through dealership. Where most of the car uh, you talk about, I don't, or in big five, big three, they go for dealership. And that's where the money is. Like the, when dealers sell their car, they make a little profit, but their long-term profit is, is servicing, right? So where Tesla, they don't have so many dealerships. So they have their in-house technician who, who, who diagnose and fix the car. And they are not widespread. There are a lot of states there they don't want them to come, and there's you see a lot of battle come up. So the Tesla is ramping up. They are just start getting the data in, and they are they know their problem in the car. That's why they are building the infrastructure, how to do OTA update and how to fix the car. But it will take time to get at the scale of where GM or Ford is. They have every single town, they have two, three dealership. Uh, they can bring the car in, they can diagnose, they can fix it. But for Tesla, it will take time because they have to go a long way. They have to build the, the entire supply chain, the dealership network, their own. So that's where you will sometimes feel um, they're not catering all the customer at there. At some point time, they will do that. And not all the car are in the shape where they can do all the predatory maintenance because it's just started. So. It will eventually it will gonna happen. Is that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just one last wrap up. Again, Edwin from Next Reality. So what you guys are saying is you guys are creating a language from consumer to manufacturer as a service and unification for all vehicles to speak on, whether it's their mobility connected from vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to road, vehicle to pedestrian, and at the same time learning while it's actively purchased, while we're actively purchasing, is that, is that? Well, I, there are two different things, let's not, confirm. so, Jonathan is talking more up about supply chain and OEM, and I'm talking about more enabling the technology in the vehicles. So next generation of vehicle with more software driven. Initially, like the OEMs used to think uh, from hardware perspective, like perspective of uh, hardware, but now going forward, everything will be software driven. Your ADAS system, B2X infrastructure, that's totally software. The things have completely changing. What uh, I'm offering as my startup, we are offering uh, a device, we call it gateway. We provide a software, we call it so, uh, operating system. And third is like cloud infrastructure. So how, let me uh, explain. So in, in, in your car, you have multiple subcomponent. We have heterogeneous network. So there is uh, body control that control your lightings and doors and everything. Then you have ADAS system that autonomous driving. Then you have a telematic system. Uh, there are, Many subcomponent altogether, they need to talk to the OEM backend 
somewhere. So this device, they connect with all the heterogeneous network, whether it's your ECU, uh, ADAS system, or connectivity, or V2X, that together. So you can put all the SOP component together. And then the master gateway connect and tell the back end to your office, okay, what's happening? What need to be updated? What service need to enable? Um, if you need to push some OT update, a new software, it will go through the cloud to the gateway and gateway will allocate that particular software package, that particular. Need. So that, that what uh, my startup is doing. And it's not just only uh, making for cards. So we are building a cross platform. You can take that hardware to any, any sort of vehicle. It could be a truck, it could be a bus, it could be a scooter as well. So, so we are taking the same approach. We are building a computer that's okay, so modular. Up. Uh, you can put connectivity, everything. So you need not to physically visit your dealer to fix that thing. The, the person who is sitting uh, on you remotely uh, as an OEM, he can find the problem, he can fix it, he can diagnose it, he can do over the update, and he can schedule a service if the mechanical or physical need to, things need to be changed. Close it up. And I'll just have three quick points because we've got to wrap it up. We're getting the, we're getting the cane. Um, Edwin, specifically, you're talking about. So, from, the supply, from our standpoint, yes, we are software as a service, okay, which is another revolution for a supply chain platform like this to be able to run as a service in the cloud, okay. Also, we're relying on AI. We have AI, so the system will be adaptive. It will be self-learning as it goes on and as people's business processes change and each unique OEM and supplier and partner in the supply chain um, deals with it. And it's flexible, it's completely flexible. There's no programming in it. You basically sit down and you just, through workflow management tools, you basically just define the workflows and the software just, it's self-executing software based on just workflow driving things. So yes, it's completely adaptive to all those trends that you just discussed. discussed, discussed. So with that, um, are we, are we wrapped up here? So any, like any flat, uh, do we have time for another question or? No, yes, okay. We do? We don't, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank appreciate you your attention. Time.